Cole Swenson, our final poet of the evening, is the author of 19 collections of poetry, a collection of critical essays called Noise That Stays Noise, and most recently, Art in Time, a collection of hybrid poetic or lyric essays on innovative landscape art. Her work has won the Iowa Poetry Prize, the San Francisco State Poetry Center Book Award, and the National Poetry Series, and has been finalist twice for the LA Times Book Award and once for the National Book Award. A translator of contemporary French poetry, prose, and art criticism, she has also won the Penn USA Award in Literary Translation, and she divides her time between the US and France. Welcome, Cole. Sorry. <laughs> no, you've got a big job break. there. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for having me. And thanks for the organization. And, and thanks to Hazal, um, who's not here because she's touring the United States. So um, I'm going to read from a series of recent pieces. Um, for some reason, at the start of COVID, my writing habit changed entirely. And I, I've been writing things that I unlike anything I've ever written before. There are absurdist pieces, which I think are kind of maybe a bit in response to the world. Um, they're short and silly. So. Sun versus sun. On particularly bright days, the panes of sunlight are shattered by the sun's rays. They get all broken up. It's pretty brittle stuff. And yet nothing is lost. You can reconstruct them like jig jigsaw puzzles which is what meteorologists do when it rains. The doorknob. The doorknob is turning on its own. The dog watches it from across the room. She knows that the door will swing open and that nothing will enter. It happens every evening at about this time. And she knows that the people will come back a little later and accuse each other of having once again left the door open and good god the dog could have gotten out but she hasn't she's across the room keeping her eye on the door as she always is at this hour cherry tree in spring the oddest things sing i'm not talking about the tree that's expected but so much else there it stands in the middle of a huge field, all in flower, and one of hundreds that flash by the train windows, which break into song at the sight of them. And of course, at a frequency beyond that of human perception, but a human can nonetheless just barely sense the charge between each tree and pane of glass as an infinitesimal electrical zap that, for the one looking out the window, manifests as a split second of hyper-attention which collapses the distance, and suddenly, there you are, under the blossoming tree, and then under the next one, and then the next, and so on, until you realize that, in fact, you're traveling by tree rather than by train. Crows. Nothing knows, and thus there is nothing known. And what is, <clears throat> and that's what their black is all about. Each bird an instance of redacted sky, followed by more sweeping deletions, marks of absolute doubt. This evening there are dozens, tiny blackouts in universal consciousness, collecting in the trees at the back of the house. They prefer the bare ones, in which they pose as black flowers on the almost black branches that look down on the tulip magnolia which also flowers from bare limbs, though its flowers are still trying to figure out how to get free, like those volatile blossoms on the tree above. A pencil. It's where it wanders in its silver, its granular tracery. You're writing in mineral, which creates gravity, which means a gravitational field, and one so incredibly tiny that nothing visible falls into its orbit, though so many invisible things are irresistibly attracted. Exactitude, for example. It will follow a pencil for miles, which makes you wonder, particularly if you're a writer who always writes in pencil, how many miles you've written in your lifetime. And for artists whose principal medium is graphite, how many acres 
And above all, for those working in landscape, do the acres created ever resemble the scenes that they've drawn? Or does it in fact work the other way around with the acres drawing themselves through the hands of an artist who thinks she's simply imagining it all? Early milestones of abstract expressionism. It was the early 1940s and a painter exploring new avenues in abstraction was experimenting with working right up close to the canvas, her nose only a couple of inches away. Completely absorbed in her work, she applied patches and streaks of color according to the rhythms of her body and the impulses of her mind. At the end of several hours, utterly exhausted, and with the canvas now completely covered, she dropped her brushes into turpentine and left the studio without looking back and noticing that, though utterly abstract, the work just happened to exactly resemble a line of giant oaks along the bank of a river with several swans on the water and a woman reading on the far shore. The Trick of the Tiny, and this is about a gorgeous painting um, that is not a small painting, but it's, it's done with the detail of a miniature. Roger van der Rieden's Brock family trick 1452 in the Louvre is only partly in the Louvre. Much of it actually occurs in some other country only accessible through acute detail. And that's why the detail is there. As you lean in closer and closer, which you have to do to see it at all, your peripheral vision gets blocked out, isolating you, cutting you off from your herd, as it were, which allows the painting, like any predatory being, to take hold of you gently and pull you in inexorably. It's such a lovely world in which a white horse walks off down a curving road through green fields with a figure walking along behind. And as you lean in even closer to see who it is, you become her. Is, is there a window open that could be closed? I'm just wondering. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, it, it, it happened. <coughs> Back with the crows, with their intricate nose. There goes a clutch unknotting itself against the sky almost white. It's that time of evening. And I've never understood it. Why, at the end of the day, is the sky so much lighter in color when it's actually much less bright? The crows, and now it's a skein of them, still say no, and they're adamant about it, so I'm inclined to believe them. A word for it. There's a French expression, I think it's mouton du, mouton du ciel, excuse me, mouton du ciel. I ran across it in a poem, or was it un troupeau de nuages? In any case, the clouds as sheep equation was firmly established, and I've run across it at least once more since. I'm thinking about it tonight because the small puffs of cloud trotting past are distinctly sheep-like in their shape and flock. And then my eye alights on the field directly across from my window in which a real flock of real sheep employed by the state of California to eat up the dry grass and thus reduce the fire danger are munching away. To see the earth thus reflected in sky as if the latter was a reconstitution of the former. Though for that matter, the sheep in the sky are moving much faster. They seem in fact to be hightailing it out of here, which gives one pause for thought. Though perhaps in fact, one should not pause. And the next two, I spent um, a lot of COVID couple of years in California because I was teaching at a distance. And I spent a lot of that time hiking in these trails. It's a quasi rural area just north of, Cal of San Francisco. Deer bloom. There's a deer bloom in the oak grove, petal by petal with each eye more open. They watch us pass with a hint of suspicion, but with a larger one of humor which we can't quite come to admit is derision. Deer bloom among oaks, a kind of soft dawn, a refracted fawn radiating into day. It's the stillness that emanates from their watchful bodies, even when startled, leaping up, alarmed, there's yet something so orchid about them, something waxed in the calm of their aloft. I was walking up a trail last week and was interested to see so many times the emphatic imprint of a deer's hoof 
over and into the tracks of a mountain bike tire. Though most deer bloom only at night, it's the ambient sounds that are out at that hour that allow them to flower, innumerable and untraceable, that yet they enable them to open, to bloom even among their predators, and in fact, to bloom right in their faces, coyotes, mountain lions, etc. Disguising yourself as a flower is an extremely effective protective mechanism because the predator is never prepared for the fact that you can and do simply get up and walk away. The iris migration. They come over the hills in mobs. At first, you glance off the trail to the left and are stunned by a field of them, thousands, when just last week you were here at the very same spot and there were only a few. But then your ear starts to catch a distant drumbeat. At first, it sounds like soft footfalls, perhaps tiny feet on moss or fallen leaves. But then as you listen, and more closely, it becomes clearly a multitude and then a stampede, all still soft, but that, in its sheer numbers, riotously sweeps before you in a blizzard of violet, wild irises in herds, swarms, hordes, kicking up a fluttering siege as they make their way to the sea. Or perhaps it's more accurate to say wild irises marauding, for here they come careening, still by the thousands. You can hear them from acres, maybe even counties away. The hoof of an iris is so incredibly acute, so finely tuned, that the sound it makes is perfectly timed to every bit of territory it passes over. And so much so that, taken all together, they create an intricate, though audible only to the most discerning, orchestra of oohs and ahs, as irises are particularly susceptible to the beauty of the views that they encounter as they crest every new ridge. Owls. An owl is always early, striking some as eerie, when it's really just an airiness of hour, as if the darker it gets, the more air there is, which makes its body more buoyant, which lets its wings beat harder, and at each beat, they beat yet more air into the dark. And thus, the air in the hour continually grows until just before dawn, when it drops off sharply and settles as dew across lawns. Owls and edges. An owl is all about edges. You can see it any evening. It's all disheveling grading by degrees, and as the darkness progresses, so do the edges, and each one is a wing. It may not belong to any given thing, but the owl tends to gather them, being the night gleaner, the gatekeeper, and therefore responsible for strays. Stray wings are a problem all over the world and a danger because if they all get together, which they seem likely to do, and soon, They'll cover the sky enough to block out the sun and just imagine the harm that that will do. Though that's not their goal. That's not what they want at all. They just want to talk, to know how you are, to ask about your life, how it's going, and to exchange a few pleasantries, maybe about the weather, for instance. And then they'll sigh and agree that it's been pretty gloomy lately. Tree and tree. I was at a colleague's apartment for the first time recently and was sitting facing a white wall on which was painted a lovely pale gray image of the upper branches of a tree. An hour or so later, I noticed that the shadow cast on the same wall by a tree outside her window had a very similar form. And as I watched, it came closer and closer until it finally clicked, a perfect fit. You could almost hear it, but just for an instant, and then it moved on. When I mentioned it to her later, she exclaimed, ah, yes, it happens only once a year, and I forgot that it was today. And oddly enough, I have another friend who also has the shadow of a tree painted in faint gray on a white wall. It's the silhouette of a cherry tree in flower, but the tree outside the window, which casts its shadow on the wall every afternoon, is a parasol pine, 
And so the beauty in this case is based entirely on disparity. The owl is back. The owl is back with its little hoots, a bit like something soft and huddled, like a tiny sofa, backing up, oo-ooing instead of beeping. And we picture her on her branch, stalking back and forth, the hooting, a form of chatting with sisters and friends, except that, no, owls are much more solitary than that. And so we begin to hear it as a form of singing that so deeply knows that single note that she can create an entire opera out of it. Components of a garden. Moon. Things grown in moonlight, metallic in sound. The moon sheds a wind, needle in kind. Any seed planted under a new moon will come up poisonous. Any planted under a foal will walk on its own, will walk all night casting a mineral light that will blind the moon. Sun. Unlike the moon, there is no new sun, and the man walking with a blazing torch will disappear at noon. Water. Who walked a lake, walking every small thing golden in its light. Who walked on back, behind the sun, walking over water. Farther goes the going over to calm, now morning, and all egret all around it, a pond. Birds. Birds are small things. They are berries in the branches, bending the branches, breaking the berries with their tendency toward bursting, staining, and instantly the stain of bird song all over the otherwise pristine air, the air now beyond repair. And yet they continue to be small things, too small to be held accountable and stealing or caught feasting on seedlings so that at times the trees bloom only inside them. Night, dim silence in stamen, in pistol drawn blind. Night is a fall of footsteps, a rhythm in the leaves. The bells come back alive. Night counts by them or by the branch that scrapes or the pear that drops and never lands. Tools. The hand on its own grows a steel edge. The hand conforms. The bones wrap around. Some of the earliest tools were made of bone. The hand wraps around a year and makes it a stone, and the year rages on. The hand is man's only real tool, basking in the sun throughout a busy afternoon. And the last one, gardeners. Think gardener of every Think gardener of signs. Let me hand you the hand of a man who gardens time. Birds, the gardeners of the sky. There's a person at the far end of the garden who seems not to be paying much attention to all of this, who seems to be leaning over and raking the dark earth with her hands, though in fact, it's not the earth and it's not so dark, but it is your heart. Thank you.